as, as you guys know, Imran Khan introduced and uh, he 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 begged the UN to recognize Islamophobia, and he smuggled in the criticism of Islam as well. Even though, when you look at the um, uh, the press release of the UN, is the word Islam is only mentioned once, and that is in Islamophobia. <laughs> uh, the rest of the press statement includes only about it only talks about bigotry towards muslims hatred towards muslims etc etc so the definition of islamophobia by the un is exactly the same as we say that there should be no anti-muslim bigotry but islamophobia is not the correct term it's a misnomer and you should not you should be allowed to criticize islam but imran khan used that uh, to his advantage and he smuggled in let me find that tweet this is imran khan's tweet where he said, today, the UN has finally recognized the grave challenge of confronting the world of Islamophobia, respect for religious symbols and practices, and of curtailing system, systematic hate speech. So forget about the rest part, this part, respect for religious symbol, symbols and practices. So he basically asking the West to introduce blasphemy laws, um, respect for religious symbols and practices, even though the recognition of Islamophobia Day has got nothing to do with respect for religious symbols and practices. Nobody is going to, we can respect your right to worship whatever God you want, but it does not include, respect does not mean that you are somehow immune from criticism. That is how the UN understands it as well, but they didn't want to rock the boat. So in that relation, yesterday we had this event organized by ex-Muslims of Kerala called Declaring March 16th as International Day for Exposing Islamophobia and Combating Muslimophobia. Now, all these wonderful speakers were a part of that. Mariam Namazi, myself, and my friend Ghalib Kamal. Um, so you can watch that. Uh, it's very interesting. It's about two hours and 35 minutes. Uh, you can listen to it a bit. You can increase the pace. Um, and there you go. You can see, I think Mariam Namazi spoke really well over there, and we discussed um, these topics quite a bit in detail. I gave a little bit of a history lesson on, oops, that's not a good photo, <laughs> uh, a bit of a history lesson on freedom of speech and how the West actually struggled um, to get where we are or how the West struggled to achieve freedom of speech. Um and so, yeah, so go and check it out. I think you're probably going to like it. Uh, finally, I wanted to say something about hate speech. I think I personally am not against hate speech. And I think that is part of freedom of expression. I think the problem with hate speech is that a lot of what we say is considered hate speech. Uh, and if you look at a lot of religious texts, actually, that is pure hate speech in and of itself. And I think we have to draw the line where speech incites violence. And I think there's a distinction to be made. Um, I, I therefore think that, you know, we have to be careful in uh, opposing hate speech. I think bad speech, hate speech, the response to it is speech that is not hateful, that is against hate. And I think that's the way to combat any form of hate, hateful speech rather than banning it um, or um, because it's, it's much more nuanced than that. And a lot of criticisms um, that we make is considered hate speech. And finally, it goes to the issue that um, Erin uh, brought up and the fact that, you know, you've got one of the reasons we're not seen as victims is because we are seen to be promoting hate speech in what we say. And therefore, it's very similar to the woman who was raped and, you know, people looking at the length of her skirt and blaming her for what happened to her. And I think, again, that is that line where, uh, you know, we are seen to be, it's it's victim blaming, isn't it? And, and that's why, um, you know, I think, as we've all raised, um, it, it's a very nuanced discussion. The fact that we have to be free to speak, even if it's considered hateful, as long as there's no incitement to violence. 
uh, we have to defend that freedom of expression and and the idea that human rights is for all of us refugee rights is for the non-believers as well human rights and free expression is for the non-believer as well and i think this is the way to go about it you know opposing both um and defending universal values and rights thank you Secondly, with hate speech, I think I slightly disagree with a little with Mariam just a little bit, because I, I get that that hate speech. We, it's easier said than done that we need to draw a line of violence. Yes, someone literally has to say that go and do so and so to so and so a group of people. Then you'd be like, okay, we can arrest you. But then hate can be spread a lot more subtly without saying the. Uh, without calling for violence so explicitly. And the biggest example that we all see is that how I have seen the rise of Hindutva. Some people say that Hindutva has always been there. They've always spoken along those terms. Uh, yes, sometimes they go, now they're becoming so brazen that they're explicitly calling for rape of Muslim women or, or, or calling them all kinds of insulting names. But even the names, insulting names, like uh, they, 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 they have a nickname for circumcised men, for example, and they just refer to them with that word. And that and we see that how it riles up so many people. And then it just, it just creates this whole movement. So even though we, I agree that we should be adult enough that we can say uh, hateful, uh, what they perceive as hateful, even though it's not hateful, really. I mean, because ideologies don't have feelings. And I think the clear line that we can draw is that we should always be careful when we're talking about groups of people, whether they're Muslims or, or Hindus or Christians or whoever they are, especially atheists as well. And we need to tell Muslims that as well. That kafrophobia is a real thing as well. They, they need to be careful when they talk about kafirs. Um, so whenever we're talking about groups of people, I think that's when we need to be, be careful. But when it comes to Islam, yes, throw it under the bus. And I agree with Mariam that people think that what we're saying is hateful. Now, yes, the definitions of hate speech and hateful is all messed up. Um, but the last thing, I just want to wrap it up with this point that I think we also need to take responsibility for the words that come out of our mouths. I sometimes do become a bit antagonistic when, we, when I make fun of Islam. But I'm always very careful when it comes to actually criticizing critiquing groups of people or discussing their behaviors. Yes, when, you, when you're covering a news story that includes a, a, uh, a, 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 a person who happened to be a Muslim man and then he attacks a synagogue in Texas, how do you report it? You're going to call him a terrorist because that's what he is. Um, but how, how do we actually tell our audiences and how careful we are with our selection of words? I think it does matter because otherwise it can. I don't want to see a day, for example, this big Islamic cleric, Dr. Israel, who was recently taken down by YouTube. Why? Because a Texas synagogue attacker used to listen to him. He was inspired by him. But I didn't find an explicit video where he actually ever said the go and attack synagogues of Jews. He never said that. But we all know how much anti-Semitism is in Islam. And then they talk about anti-Semitism from Islamic context, from theological context, and even the fancy it up with academic terms, etc. But then how does it impact? I don't want someone, and then for example, when this Christchurch massacre happened, it was traced back to some YouTuber, and even they didn't find any explicit call for violence from that YouTuber either. But I don't, I don't want to live to see a day when someone does something really nasty and terrible, and they say, I used to listen to Hara Sultan. This is why I spend a lot of my time, I spend a lot of time criti criticizing Islam in all its glory. I, I make, I mock Islam, I make fun of Islam, I just, any, any, any possible way you can within the realm of reason, I, I do attack that, but I, at the same time, almost same amount of time is spent condemning Islamic jihadis and also Hindutva people and also uh, not as much, but I do, my science is quite clear on far right white nationalist movements in the West as well. So I think that it, it needed a bit of clarification, but anyway. Um, Arif, I'm sorry, can I just say, make one point and uh, just, just to um, clarify things. I think the problem with hate speech is very much similar to the concept of Islamophobia. And I think that's what the problem is, because if you look at legislation on hate speech, a lot of it is also related to criticism of religion in various national legislations. A criticism of religion, it's not just about people. And I think that's why um, it's, it's like the whole concept of Islamophobia. It's mixed, it's conflating 
various things. And generally, it's the, mo the least powerful who bear the brunt of it, and that's us. Do you know what I mean? It's people who uh, are speaking, and um, because it's considered hateful, um, and there are many examples of all of us being kicked out of here and there for being inflammatory and hateful and this and that, when we haven't even mentioned anything negative about Muslims. And I think that's why uh, even this blanket thing, oh, we should be against hate speech, is not a statement we should make. Uh, and if we do, it needs to be with a lot of clarification because there is an equation with what we say um, as being hateful. I'll leave it at that. To help me produce more videos like these, support me on Patreon or PayPal.